winter. And also look at some expectations for the Gulf of Mexico along with expectations for the uh, Balkan and Permian. Uh, we're going to be rolling out some new stuff that uh, we consider exciting and we've been able to track real-time production here over the last few months and uh, we'll uh, cover all that today in today's webinar. First of all, I just want to let everyone know that everyone attending will be getting a copy of these slides. So if you if you do want a copy, please uh, email us and you will get that copy. And also throughout this uh, webinar, you can ask questions in the, uh, the chat box. Uh, there's a questions box on your uh, webinar uh, box. You can type those in and at the end of the webinar, we will answer those at the end of the presentation. And whichever ones we don't get to because of time constraints, we will email you directly and get you an answer if we can't get to them all. Uh, today the presenters will be myself, uh, Randall Collum, I'm the uh, Managing Director of the Supply Side Analytics here at Genscape, and Jody Quinnell, uh, who is our Oil Product Manager, who has a background uh, originally as a fracking engineer and has been in oil analytics for the last several years. Spring Rock Production is the arm of Genscape that does all our production forecasting and analytics. Uh, they were acquired by Genscape in 2012. And uh, we, the spring rock portion does both natural gas, oil, and NGL production forecasts on a five-year basis for both the U.S. and Canada. Just go over a little bit of our agenda today, what we'll be covering. Uh, first off, we'll start off with real-time impacts of the winter weather on the Bakken and Permian production, how the basins are recovering for the, from those impacts of the, the cold, harsh winter weather. Uh, we'll then go into the Gulf of Mexico expectations and new project ramp-ups as we're seeing four big projects expected to ramp up uh, offshore this year. Uh, we will then cover our uh, five-year North American production forecast outlook. And then lastly, we will uh, do a, a little overview of our new U.S. oil production and pipe flow analysis report that we put out on a weekly basis tracking real-time production in over 50% of the U.S. currently, and we hope to add to this as well. This is something we think that kind of separates us from our competitors as we are able to accurately determine real-time oil production. State data can be anywhere from four to 18 months lag. Uh, so our competitors basically have to wait for that data to come out to adjust their forecast. We can see what's happening on a real-time basis, and we can make uh, quicker adjustments to our forecast as things change in real time. Uh, last slide I'll be covering here, then I'll hand it over to Jody. Uh, these two uh, lines from the graph, the red line is Permian production and the blue line is Bakken production. As you can see, uh, this winter, uh, the peak uh, in the Permian Basin on a month-on-month -month basis, in December we had about 70,000 barrels offline on average for the month uh, from where production was uh, trending there in October. Uh, on a peak day, we had almost 500,000 barrels a day impacted from the cold weather, that first initial winter storm that hit November with ice there in the Permian Basin. And uh, the Bakken, on a little bit smaller scale than the Permian, uh, averaged about 50,000 barrels a day impacted from the winter storms uh, on a month-on-month -month basis, and we had peak days of 150,000 barrels a day um, shut in. So uh, I'll now hand it over to Jody, who is our crude oil products manager. Thanks, Randall. Um, so I'm first going to start off by talking about um, some of the details on what went on in the Bakken over the winter months, and uh, first start off by talking about our methodology for um, forecasting and um, producing a daily production estimate for the Bakken region. Um, Genscape currently uh, monitors about 86% of all crude movements out of the Bakken on a daily basis. Um, we do this through uh, monitoring two major pipelines. Um, the first one is the Tesoro pipeline that goes into their Mandan refinery, um, as well as the Enbridge, North Dakota mainline that goes into Clearbrook, Minnesota. Um, we monitor both those um, and have daily flows on both those pipelines, as well as um, we monitor 13 different rail terminals within the Bakken. Um, so this uh, graph is depicting uh, those real-time flows and uh, that sample, that really good sample that we have of um, production moving out of the region. Now when we take this uh, daily monitored flows and we regress it against historical state oil production data, uh, the two are very, very highly correlated. So what we're able to do is we're able to use that regression to help us predict uh, daily production that's coming out of the Bakken. Um, if we look at this slide, um, it's showing us uh, that 
uh, regressed value. So the red line is that uh, regressed value I was just talking about. Um, the blue line is our production estimate for the Bakken region. And then the green line is that state uh, historical production data. So what you can see here is that um, you know, we had a pretty significant impact um, on a monthly basis. Uh, from November to December, we saw a drop of almost 50,000 barrels a day. And then production for December, January, February uh, stayed nearly at that level. Um, and then in March, we saw it jump back up to those levels that we saw in November. Um, so pretty significant impact um, that we saw uh, because of the weather going on there. As you can see, um, the very last data point um, on the red line is uh, the April production uh, data that we have coming in for the month. And that appears to be coming in slightly lower than uh, the March uh, production numbers came in, um, which could be due to some of uh, the road restrictions that start to become in place in uh, the basin. So as things start to thaw up, um, there are certain weight restrictions on certain roads within North Dakota, uh, which does uh, sometimes slow production a little bit. So that we might be seeing some of that. Um, also, that number could come up as the month goes on as well. Um, another thing, uh, just to cover here while we're on it, is that uh, you know we're still predicting a pretty significant growth to come from the Bakken um, over the course of the next couple years. So we're at around. Um, 950,000 barrels a day, and we're expecting by the end of 2015 to be up uh, over 1.2 million barrels a day. So still, um, even though we had uh, you know some slowdown uh, because of the winter uh, that the they experienced up there in North Dakota, um, we're still predicting pretty uh, significant growth over the next couple years um, as things get started back up. When we look at um, North Dakota production on a daily basis, um, so this is the daily impact that we saw. Uh, production was impacted uh, almost 150,000 barrels a day at its peak uh, when we look at daily production volumes. Uh, this graph is showing the, in the blue that is uh, the oil production, and it's a seven-day rolling average. And then uh, the red line is average temperatures on a seven-day rolling average for Williston, North Dakota. And what you can see, the beginning part of November here, uh, temperatures were up in you know, around 35, 30 degrees. Um, and we had production peaking at over a million barrels a day um, on a daily average. And then as uh, the temperatures really cooled off um, and a big uh, winter storm moved through the region the beginning part of December, you can see we went from 30 degrees down to uh, negative 10 degrees. And this is an average temperature, so the lows were probably 10 to 20 degrees lower than these average temperatures. Um, we saw nearly 150,000 barrel a day impact to production over that same time frame. Um, then we uh, saw about 135,000 barrel a day increase in production uh, over in the middle of January as temperatures came back up to around 30 degrees. And then we saw another impact um, towards the end of, or the beginning of March, um, about 100,000 barrels a day impact as temperatures fell uh, to zero degrees uh, during that time frame. Um, since then, we've seen temperatures uh, moderate, um, you know, hitting 40 degrees in the, in the 30, 40 degree range, and uh, you can see how production uh, came up from there. So, um, you know, it's pretty interesting to see how correlated and how much uh, production up in the Bakken is impacted by um, the weather, uh, cold temperatures, uh, not only cause freeze-offs, but uh, when you get a big winter storm, it's also hard to move the production from uh, the wellhead to, um, to market, really. So um, these were the impacts that we saw. Now moving over to the Permian Basin. Uh, the Permian Basin was hit pretty hard uh, in November, as well as another um, impact in December that we saw. And, uh, you know, if, the Fox News headline from November 24th really uh, hit home what was going on in the Permian Basin during that time frame. Um, storm dumps, ice and rain on Texas and Oklahoma threatens Thanksgiving travel in the south and the east. Uh, so they were hit pretty hard, not only with cold temperatures, but also uh, with ice and freezing ice and rain. Um, a couple producers also came out in their fourth quarter earnings calls, uh, which were happening in February and commented on this storm and how it impacted their volumes. Uh, 
Atlas Pipeline Partners really kind of summed it up nicely. Um, their volume growth continued on their West Texas system during the fourth quarter. However, a severe storm in late November resulted in loss of approximately 50% of the wellhead volumes for seven days and uh, continued reductions in volume until the past week in which all affected wells are finally returned to production. So it not only impacted uh, production as the storm was going on, but uh, there was production that didn't get turned back on until um, late into February. Uh, Pioneer also commented uh, saying Q4 production was curtailed by 5,000 barrels a day of oil equivalent uh, due to the severe winter storm. So that's kind of, uh, you know, wrapping up uh, what producers were saying about that. And here's what we saw in our daily uh, production flow estimates from that region. You can see here uh, when that winter storm hit, there was almost half a million barrels a day that was impacted uh, in the Permian. And then um, in early December, there was another cold spell that went through that region where temperatures fell to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, significantly cold for um, you know, that West Texas region uh, where production fell 250,000 barrels a day during that event. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, you can see that in this second event, temperatures were uh, significantly colder than the first event, uh, but production wasn't impacted as much. And what we saw is that um, there wasn't near the, the impact to um, trucks and things like that uh, because there wasn't as much ice associated with the storm. So the first storm was impacted not only by freeze-offs, but it was also impacted um, by the ability to get crude from a wellhead to a lease site. Another thing to note on this graph too is that um, during October, we were cruising along at about 1,450,000 barrels a day from production um, in the Permian Basin. And when things came back online in late December and, and production ramps back up, you can see that we were only at about 1.4 million barrels a day. So there was still a pretty a portion, as uh, you know, Atlas summed it up nicely, still a portion of production that really didn't come back online until uh, February. Just uh, to comment and to make some comments on our methodology for the Permian Basin and how we calculate our daily flow estimates, it's slightly different than what uh, we do in the Bakken. Um, for the Permian, we're actually looking at um, the gas pipeline flow nomination volumes, and we're correlating that against um, historical state production data, and the two are very highly correlated. Um, one thing to note here is that we have gone through a pretty rigorous process of uh, pulling out those gas nominations uh, that are basically associated with the oil production. Um, so it's not a complete sample of all of the gas that's leaving the Permian Basin. We really have uh, gone into significant length to pull out uh, those points, those gas points that we know are associated um, with the oil production that's coming out. And when uh, we regress these two together, um, very highly correlated, and so we're able to use that regression um, and those daily uh, gas flows to predict uh, um, daily production coming out of there, which allows us to um, show the impact of what happened uh, during this winter. When we look at um, this graph, this graph is similar to the one that we looked at uh, for the the Bakken region, you can see that um, that 70,000 barrel a day impact that we saw um, from October to December, uh, we saw that 70,000 barrel a day drop on a monthly basis, and then uh, production didn't come back to that level um, that we saw in October till February. Since then, uh, we've seen a pretty significant surge, on, surge in uh, the amount of production that's coming out of there on a daily basis. And April um, is...
everyone. Sorry, we're just experiencing some difficulties with the um, audio. If you could just hold on a moment. All right, guys, sorry about that. It looks like uh, Jody in a Boulder office lost internet connectivity, so I'm going to try and uh, take I think we're back and up and running. Oh, you're back. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, do you want me to go ahead, Randall? Yeah, go ahead, Jody. Sorry about okay. that. Um, so as you can see, uh, we did see that 70,000 barrel a day uh, drop in production um, over those winter months. And then, as I was saying, a, a significant surge in production as we've moved into April here. Um, And so uh, what we've seen with uh, Permian production is that, uh, you know, we're at about 1.5 million barrels a day currently, and um, we're predicting production to climb uh, to over 1.9 million barrels a day uh, by the end of 2015. So a pretty significant uh, increase in production uh, that we're predicting to come from the Permian Basin. One thing to know and one thing to uh, keep an eye on is that we have seen a pretty significant increase in rig counts um, as well as a pretty significant increase in the amount of horizontal rigs that are operating in the basin. So uh, we have um, seen an increase of about 114 rigs uh, since the low point um, in, in the rig count uh, which happened in June or July of last year. Uh, we've added 114 rigs to the fleet within the Permian Basin, and, um, and uh, we're up over peak uh, rigs operating within the Permian Basin. We just passed that peak that we saw in 2012. So um, lots of horizontal rigs uh, moving into the region, and I believe that uh, there is upside risk to our production forecasts uh, because of this factor. Um, we're keeping a close eye on it and we have a pretty significant um, increase in our IP rates uh, through our forecast period, but I still feel that um, if anything there's upside risk to our production uh, forecast because of what's going on within the Permian Basin. So now switching over uh, to cover uh, what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico um, and some of the recent project startups uh, that we're tracking. Um, we're able to uh, predict daily production uh, from a lot of the large oil producing platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, um, utilize um, the same sort of methodology that we have uh, utilized within the Permian Basin. Um, we're looking right here at the cardium fields. Uh, this field is tied back to the auger platform, so this is production from both uh, the cardium field and that auger uh, field. So what you can see is um, 
The auger platform was shut down to tie in the Cardian field um, the middle of July, and that was shut down for approximately four months uh, as they tied back this field uh, to that producing platform. And then what we saw is um, at the beginning of March, we saw that Cardian field start to ramp up. So you can see um, the 30,000 barrel a day increase uh, we had here from uh, previous uh, production levels. So um, what you've seen is you've seen kind of some uh, volatile movement in the production uh, from this field and likely just a result of some startup um, type issues that they're working through to get this field online. But we feel that um, we will see this field ramp up over the next couple months. Um, as Shell said in one of their press releases, um, that once online in 2014, Cardium um, is expected to produce at a peak rate of uh, 50 thousand barrels of oil equivalent per day. So I, I still feel there's room uh, for, ramp, for a little bit of ramp up from that field and um, we've already seen some um, go on. Another uh, area that we are in platform that we're tracking production from is the Thunder Horse platform. Um, and um, they recently installed some water injection facilities. They did that in May of last year. Um, that platform went down for a couple of months as they installed these facilities. It also, also coincided with some maintenance that was going on at the Pascagoula uh, processing plant. But then um, towards the end of the year, we started to see productions uh, ramp up as um, they started uh, some of these water injections at this field. And then more recently, we've seen uh, production go from about 75,000 barrels a day to uh, just under 100,000 barrels a day. So pretty significant ramp up um, that we've seen at Thunder Horse uh, because of this water injections. Uh, as BP commented in their second quarter 2013 earnings calls, um, they believe that the performance in Thunder Horse should be coming up, especially as we get water injections going over the next couple of years. So we believe that um, you know this some of this water injection activity is just starting to increase production and that um, there'll be more production increases to come. Also, um, the Mars B project recently came online. Um, came online as uh, BP commented in their fourth quarter earnings calls on February 4th that um, that project had come online on that day. Um, this graph we're looking at here is production from um, daily production from the Mars, Ursa, and Olympus platforms. Um, so it's all combined together. But if we just look at, um, and that's when the first oil uh, started on that uh, Mars B project. If we look at just uh, Mars B as an individual um, graph here, you can see that um, we didn't see first oil start until um, it was about the 4th of March. Uh, so that was a few days after um, or a, a, about a month after a BP had commented that the project had started up. So it could have just been uh, some startup issues that went on there for that month lag. But we saw that uh, project come online and then um, it lasted, you know, over the month, the course of the month, uh, we saw production basically ramp up to 20,000 barrels a day. So a pretty significant increase um, at that Mars B uh, project that BP recently brought online. Um, They've commented that this project uh, could be uh, or reach peak, pr peak production levels of 50,000 barrels a day. So there's likely some still still some ramp up to go at um, this project. Another uh, recent project uh, that began oil production recently was uh, Nikea Phase Three, um, and as BP commented, uh, the first. Nikea phase, or Nikea phase three well began oil production on February 19th, um, and a second well was expected to start up in the second quarter. So um, this basically um, the, it was shut down last year. Um, th this drop here was a result of um, some processing plant maintenance that went on um, at Pascagoula, as I was commenting, uh, Thunder Horse was also shut down for this. Um, and that lasted about a month that that facility was shut down. Um, since then, this is when the Phase 3 uh, came online. We haven't really seen a big impact from this Phase 3 yet, but I think as um, they bring on more wells at this project, uh, we should start to see production ramp up um, here as well. 
So those are four um, of the big projects that have recently started up in the Gulf of Mexico and that we're keeping a real close eye on and how they, they ramp up. Um, so what's next for the Gulf of Mexico? Um, there's four other large projects that are slated to come online in the third quarter, fourth quarter um, of this year as well as the first quarter of next year. So not only do we have uh, the projects that came online in the beginning of this year ramping up, but we will have these projects ramping up towards the end of the year. Um, you have tubular bells coming on in the third quarter. Uh, these are peak production rates that I have listed here. Uh, in our production forecast, we're assuming about a six to seven month uh, ramp up at these various projects. So tubular bells, um, uh, 40,000 barrel a day uh, peak production from that project. Uh, Jack St. Malo also coming on in the third quarter, 100,000 barrels a day. Um, Lucius Hadrian, 75,000 barrels a day in the fourth quarter, uh, expected to come online. And then um, Bigfoot in the first quarter of 2015 at a peak production rate of 50,000 barrels a day. Uh, so you can see the impact of these projects uh, to our production forecast. Um, you know, we're currently setting out about 1.3 million barrels a day coming from uh, the Gulf of Mexico and we're predicting um, by the middle of 2015 that uh, we'll have about 1.6 million barrels a day coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. So a pretty significant ramp up and lots going on um, in this region. Um, and you know, able to track it really in that real-time basis is, is key to keeping up with what's going on in, in the Gulf of Mexico as these projects ramp up. Now um, turning over and talking about uh, the more macro outlook for North America production. Um, this is a graph of both our U.S. production forecast as well as our Canadian production forecast. Um, pretty significant growth over the next couple years. Uh, we're predicting 1.5 million barrels a day year over year growth for 2014 and then an additional 1.4 million barrels a day of growth year over year for 2015. Uh, so nearly 3 million barrels a day of growth over the next couple of years uh, in North America. Um, also, you can see from this chart, um, starting out, uh, the graph started out in 2010, the beginning of 2010, uh, where the two countries were producing um, 8 million barrels a day. We're predicting um, that to more than double by the end of 2018, where we'll be producing over 16 million barrels a day um, in the U.S. and Canada. Canadian growth um, is definitely being driven by the oil sands. Um, there is a little bit of growth um, coming from the Western Canadian non-oil sands um, region, so you're more unconventional drilling that's going on um, in some of the plays. Um, but as you can see, the biggest growth driver will be those oil sands. Uh, for, Canada, for Canada, we're predicting um, 315,000 barrels a day of growth um, in 2015, or in 2014, over 13, and then additional uh, 300,000 barrels a day growth in 15 over 14. So almost six, over 600,000 barrels a day growth uh, coming from Canada over the next couple years. When we look at our U.S. production forecast, uh, about 1.2 million barrels a day of growth in 14, and then um, one point, a little over 1.1 million barrels a day of growth in 2015, um, largely being driven by uh, the Eagle Ford Bakken, Permian, and the Gulf of Mexico that we just covered there. So, um, you know, lots of lots happening um, in these various regions. When we look at um, the crude quality uh, of the U.S. growth, um, so both our Canadian and our U.S. Uh, production forecasts are broken out by crude quality. Um, as you can see from this, uh, the majority of the growth uh, is in the light crude category. So uh, 2014, 658,000 barrels a day of light crude growth, uh, 15, 567. And then, um, you know, when you look at the intermediate, uh, there's uh, some growth coming from the intermediate category. Um, this is largely a result of um, the Gulf of Mexico ramp ups. Um, as well as uh, predicting a pretty significant amount of growth um, in the condensate um, category of crude. So um, lots going on there. 
Now just to, uh, you know, kind of wrap this up and, and bring it full circle and to talk uh, about our new production report that we have. Um, this is a supplementary report to our overall U.S. Uh, forecasting service. Uh, the report is released every Monday uh, by 4 p.m. Central Time and um, is basically covers most everything that we covered in this uh, this webinar. Um, it basically has daily pipeline flow information for the Bakken, Permian, Alaska, and Gulf of Mexico. Um, it also has commentary associated uh, with each of those areas, um, showing how uh, that flow estimate is coming in uh, compared to our production estimate for the month. Um, along with the PDF report, you do receive a Excel data file. Um, that has all of the daily data dating back to 2010 for the various regions. Uh, we also cover uh, the individual field breakouts for the Gulf of Mexico. So most all of the largest oil producing flat platforms are also covered in the report as well as the associated data is provided. Um, so we feel we just have a lot going on, um, a lot of great information and uh, a way to basically predicts daily production so that we can predict such impacts as, uh, you know, winter weather on our production forecast and ramp ups in Gulf of Mexico projects in real time. And we can then uh, use this information to feed back into our forecasts uh, to really keep them uh, as up to date as possible, whereas other people are relying on six to 18 month old state data. Um, we're able to bring uh, these regions up to the present day with that real time information that we have. So at this time, um, I again want to apologize for the little delay we had there with the internet connection. Uh, thanks for all all of you for sticking with us through this whole thing. Um, but at this time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Randall, and we're going to go through some of the questions that have come in. So just give us a minute to uh, get situated here, and uh, we'll go through some of these questions. All right, Jody, I'm going to go ahead and ask you question number one that came through. I think so far there's uh, eight questions. So first question out the gate, uh, do you build any future winter impacts into your production forecast? Um, so at the present time, we do not build any uh, future weather impacts uh, into our production forecast. Um, it's just too hard to predict uh, what the weather is going to be like, um, you know, next winter in the Bakken. Um, historically, we have seen impacts um, to production, but they've been very varying impacts to production. Um, kind of depends all on what type of winter they have. Uh, you know, what kind of storms they get, things like that. So it's really hard to predict. So we haven't um, built those into our production forecasts. But, um, you know, with the real-time tracking that we have up there, uh, you know, we're able to alert you really as things are going on, what's happening up there. And so, um, and then adjust our forecasts as we see fit as things are, things are happening and things are progressing. So that's um, really how we're able to, um, to filter in some of this information into our forecast. All right, thanks. Uh, second question was with regards to using our, and I'll, I'll answer this one for you, Jody. Uh, basically asking uh, kind of what is the error around our real-time tracking versus how the states end up actualizing. Uh, the specific question is on the Bakken. So, uh, Historically, looking at the air in, this, in these regions, there's, I'd say a plus or minus 25, 30,000 barrels a day on a, a million barrels a day or so, so plus or minus 3%. Uh, what was your estimate for uh, the Bakken for November? So uh, the state data ended up coming in at 973,000 barrels a day, and our estimate using our pipe data was 965,000 barrels a day, so it was off by 8,000 barrels a day. And that's just for North Dakota, uh, separate from uh, Montana. So. Uh, that's that. And uh, one next question, Jody. Uh, how do you derive your production forecast breakdowns by quality? Yeah, so um, what we do with that is uh, for um, certain states we have, so for some of the largest oil producing states, we have information 
at the well level on what type of crude is being produced on a monthly basis. So uh, those states include Texas, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, um, Louisiana, as well as information on the Gulf of Mexico. So those states, we have well level information that we're utilizing. Um, there's some other states where we're use, utilizing that field level information, but we're trying to get as granular as we can um, on that quality information. Um, but and then we build it up um, into that the total forecast. And as you can see in that slide that I showed, there's a bit of production that we have not been able to quantify what the quality is. So we've just left that out as not reported. It's about 5% of total production. Um, but uh, really, it's trying to get to that granular piece of data. And um, a lot of it is actually at the well level that we're collecting that data for. OK, let me go to the next question. Uh, Permian Basin got into the 30s. Uh, why does that temperature affect production? Uh, it wasn't as cold as the Bakken. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer that one, too, real quick. So uh, those temperatures we showed you were average temperatures, so the, the low temperatures did get below 20 degrees. We believe 20 degrees is the, uh, the cutoff for where the wellhead freeze loss occur. But those temperatures have gotten into the low 30s and 20s, and the Permian had a lot of ice associated with it and uh, freezing temperatures out there in the, the Permian Basin, Texas, New Mexico, they're just typically not used to driving in those conditions, so it really impacted uh, picking the well up, which then impacted uh, the wells. So there's the answer to that question. Uh, next question. Do you have any quality info on any of the new fields? Um, we, it depends on the state that it's in. Um, as I was commenting before, we have well-level information on some of those states. Um, it might be lagged, so uh, you know, as that field comes online, we might not see uh, production. You know, six six months later, it might actually be reported to the state, depending on the state and all sorts of factors. But eventually, we do have uh, new information on some of the new fields that are coming out and coming online. Yeah, and I will mention there are some states that are only lagged four months, but there are some states that are lagged as much as 18 months. So, uh, Here's another question. How much of the Eagleford liquids output is condensate versus crude? Uh, we do break this out in our data, so Jody, I don't know if you have the exact percentage broken out on hand there. If we can just get back to this first one. Yeah, and it's a you know, rough estimate off the top of my head. I believe it's around 40% of um, the production that's coming out of the Eagle Ford is uh, condensate. All right, cool. Um, will winter impacts be reduced as gathering field pipelines are developed? Uh, I, the answer to this, I believe, is this is not the case. Winter impacts uh, will continue to be felt, especially in areas that aren't used to getting them. Uh, we've seen impacts every year uh, in the Rockies, just cold weather is going to impact things and sometimes there's just not a lot you can do about it. Uh, next question, do you break out crude oil qualities for Gulf of Mexico production? Um, we do have a, a production forecast for the Gulf of Mexico that is broken out by crude qualities. And uh, we're also working on um, developing specific fields um, that we've shown uh, what the quality of crude coming out of those uh, fields are. That's not yet included in the report, but something that we're looking into um, providing um, in the future. All right. Uh, then there's another question uh, asking if we have any cost data regarding the winter impacts. I'm not sure on the clarity of that question, so if you mind emailing us to get a little more clarity on exactly what you're looking for there, maybe we might be able to help you out. Um, next question. There's another question on a risk analysis tool if we use it, and the question is, or the answer to that is no. Uh, Jody, this one's for you. Do you look at estimated ultimate recoveries by well and its impact on future supply growth? Uh, what places any limit on your forecast growth? Um, 
Um, so, do we look at estimated ultimate recoveries by well and its impact on future supply growth? Um, we definitely look at uh, production profiles, so type curves um, for wells um, that we've seen. Um, so we do a very rigorous process each time we update our production forecast, looking through thousands of different uh, type curves and fitting those um, to the appropriate decline curve. So um, we definitely look at sorts of things like that, what places um, any limits on your forecast growth. Um, I don't think currently when we look at the big plays that that's a limiting factor to our growth profile. Um, well, first off, we're all doing five-year forecasts, so that's not going to impact anything on the next five years. However, we do yeah. bring in the EURs when we're estimating economics of each of these fields and going into our root forecast. So from that standpoint, yes, it does, and it will potentially put limits on it. But uh, overall, uh, ultimate recovery, when you're only going out five years in your forecast, it's, it's not going to impact things other than from an economic standpoint. Uh, okay, question for you, Jody. Do you foresee the U.S. moving toward exports, especially into Europe, uh, to ease the global crisis in supply? Um, and I'm not going to comment too much on that. Um, you know, we'd have to see, you know, at the present time you can't export crude from the U.S. Um, so we'd have to see a change in uh, really the law. Um, and, you know, I know there's some talk out there about that, but um, that would have to happen before we see any sort of exports um, out of the U.S. And I know um, there was some legislation going through and some talk about uh, allowing the export of condensate. Um, so that might be one of the first things that we see. Um, but, you know, there definitely has to be um, some, some political changes um, to be able to do that. And I will take this next question, Jody. Do you feel there will be any increased investment towards winterization of Permian fields? Uh, this will most likely be on... Uh, unlikely to occur unless it just becomes an annual uh, impact to production. Uh, this is not really going to be worth their investment to go winterize all these fields as they've typically not had to deal with many freeze-off issues out there. Uh, this is unlike uh, Western Canada where they just go in and, and they prepare for those freeze-offs with winterization. Uh, uh, back in our November article, we actually did a one-pager on uh, wellhead freeze-offs and winterization of uh, of uh, facilities and uh, producing fields and what goes into that. So if you would like a copy of that one pager, please uh, just send us an, an email. We can forward that on to you. Um, next question, and uh, we get, we've got questions coming in, so let's, uh, let's try and track at least a few more of these questions. Uh, okay, question for you, Jody. Do you use any rail tracking data to determine production changes? Uh, yes, we definitely use rail information in the Bakken to help us uh, indicate production changes. So um, that part of uh, that's part of our sample that we use um, to help us predict that production on a daily basis. So uh, we're keeping very close eye on uh, what's leaving those loading terminals in the Bakken. Uh, we have cameras um, sitting outside of those that are counting those rail cars, and then we're turning in that into um, a volumes of crude that are leaving. Um, so that's definitely an input into our uh, model that predicts uh, production changes. And I don't know if you answered this question, this one came in, uh, how does Genscape monitor rail car movements in the Balkan? Can you repeat that one? Uh, how does Genscape monitor rail car movements in the Bakken? Oh, okay. So, yeah, as I was just talking about, um, you know, we have a, a camera, high-definition uh, camera that sits outside um, these large loading terminals in the Bakken and basically takes pictures as the cars go by. And then we have um, somebody counting uh, those cars um, that went by, and uh, we associate that um, based on the, the size of the car. Um, we then have a volume estimate of how much was leaving that uh, facility on a daily basis. Uh, okay, what, here's another question for you, Jody. What qualities are measured on oil produced, and how often are qualities measured? 
Um, so the data that we have um, is monthly data. So it's basically by well by month. Um, and it can change, you know, if you look at one producing well, that API gravity that's associated with that well um, can change over time and we do see that in the data. Um, I haven't seen any significant changes, so it might change a degree here or there, um, but over time, um, you know, I haven't seen a jump of, you know, 20 API or something like that. It's usually small changes, but um, we do have the granular data um, by well and then by month as well. Okay, here's another question. Uh, do you break down production from individual Gulf of Mexico plays, such as lower tertiary, and do you see lower tertiary output making a major contribution to future Gulf of Mexico production? I'll uh, just answer this right now. We do not break it down as far as what we uh, provide to clients. Our internal models, we do break down it further to a field level. Uh, right now, we're breaking out our oil production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, between the shelf and the deep water and breaking out by crude quality. And uh, Jody, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'll go ahead and ask it because I know you're not the one tracking this data. Uh, is there any difficulty in counting cars if there is a manifest train? Um, there definitely is difficulty when it's a manifest train. Um, so the majority of, I would say, upwards of 90%, and that even might be a higher percentage of uh, rail cars leaving the Bakken are unit trains. Um, you know, we're able to see them being loaded at these big facilities and then they leave as one unit. Um, the manifests are a lot harder to track uh, because they could be loaded um, on a side track somewhere and there might only be three cars that are loaded um, at that, three or four cars that are loaded and then, you know, combined with a bunch of other different sorts of, of cars. And so that becomes a lot harder to track and uh, we currently do not track manifest movements um, on rail cars. It's more of the unit uh, trains um, that we're tracking out of the Bakken region. So there is some difficulty in tracking those manifest trains. But then again, uh, when you look at it, it's not going to be a large volume of crude compared to uh, when you're looking at those unit trains that are moving. All right, another question for you, Jody. Uh, this is going to wrap it up, but we, uh, we still have like 10 more questions that keep coming through. So we'll just get back to each one of you on an individual basis. Uh, last question uh, for Jody. Do you break out Canadian condensate production, or is it counted in with oil sands production as dilute? Um, we do have condensate production broken out uh, for Canada. So um, we're not including it in our oil sands uh, production forecast. So, uh, you know, we're really looking at the wellhead, um, what's going on, um, not further downstream. So uh, if you're interested in more about that, we can uh, definitely talk to you about uh, what we're doing up in Canada. All right, guys, and that wraps up our webinar for today. If you'd like any copies of uh, presentations, please email us. If you'd like a copy of our new uh, Oil Weekly Pipe Report tracking the different production in the different areas. We can track over 50% of the U.S. crude oil production on a daily basis. Please let us know. Thank you all for calling in, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you on the next webinar.